Hey everyone, Brayden here coming to you with a Mickey Views special report where we are going to be investigating the Disney war developing right now at the highest levels of the Walt Disney Company as Disney enters what is shaping up to be a several months long proxy war between what we're going to call establishment Disney versus a group of dissident investors who believe the company is being run into the ground despite holding some of the best entertainment franchises and theme parks in the world. To the best of my ability here, we are going to look at what has led to this, why it's happening, who the opposing sides consist of, what they disagree on, and what these dissident investors have to say, as one of them, Nelson Peltz, officially launched the Restore the Magic campaign this week, where in a 35-page slide deck, his firm details with surgical precision every problem with the current financials. Many of these points I've been saying for years, with Iger overpaying for Fox, Chapek leaning too heavily on the parks returns and not investing enough new capital in the parks and so on. Don't take that as me endorsing this attempt to get a dissident investor on the board just yet. We're going to take a look at what he has to say as well as everything else involved here. I think a lot of us with knowledge of Disney history, when we hear stuff about, you know, like uh, activist investors, proxy wars, company takeovers, corporate raiders, that stuff does not have a good smell to it uh, because I think if you know anything about Disney history, this has been a costly thing in the past for the company, but there are a lot of arguments to be made for this proxy war situation for someone new entering the board here. The situation is not as simple as we'd like it to be. There's cases to be made on both sides. This is big boy stuff. There are a lot of interpersonal dynamics and history at play between these various players. So I'm going to lay out all the facts for you as comprehensively and objectively as possible. Connect some dots for you that'll highlight how this latest push against Bob Iger and co is just the latest iteration in a decades long power struggle of dissolution investors rallying against his leadership, his board, and executive team. And also along the way, I'll give you my take as well, especially when we get to the Restore the Magic presentation, because there's some absolute gold in there. So get comfy, grab some refreshments, here we go. First up, I think it's important to establish why are investors disillusioned? Why are fans disillusioned? The big overarching reason I see is a complete lack of transparency over what has gone on at Disney over the last few years and what exactly Disney's long-term plan is, if they even have one. This one key detail will overshadow everything we talk about here today. Because as some of these investors are rallying to upset the apple cart, take away power from the current executives, put new people in there, you have to remember their basis for doing so is rooted in how mismanaged the company has appeared from the outside as of late. Prominent publications, they would not be writing daily articles on the internal corporate drama at Disney and speculating about what might be going on behind the scenes if Disney had simply told us right off the bat what was going on, why Iger was stepping down, in what capacity Chapek would be serving as CEO, why Chapek was chosen, and then in 2022, why they renewed Chapek's contract just for him to be abruptly let go later that year. As details have trickled out through corporate gossip, it has been all but confirmed that while CEO, Bob Chapek was not given the authority to lead in many respects. We discovered thanks to recent investigative reporting from the Wall Street Journal that for most of Chapek's CEO tenure, Iger, as executive chairman, was holding high-level meetings behind his back, where Chapek, the CEO, was not invited. He was not invited to these meetings. We recently found out that Iger kept his big chief executive office at Disney headquarters. All this is to say it really seems like Iger never really left. Meanwhile, we had the executives who were supposed to be reporting to Chapek leak things to the media and publicly bad-mouthing the new CEO all along the way. This is something we even saw Iger himself engage in. Under Chapek's leadership, Parks fans were nickel and dimed. The spending at Disney Plus spiraled out of control, yet the board renewed Chapek for another three years just to relieve him of duty later the same year. All of this suggests not only is there lots of internal discord and sabotage happening between the company's executives, but also the board overseeing these executives was flying blind, unaware of the full severity of the issues the company was facing at the time they renewed Chapek's contract. The belief many fans hold that Chapek was a figurehead CEO there to take the blame during the financial turmoil of 2020 and 2021, and paid quite handsomely to do so, I might add, is supported by a new allegation from the dissident investors. 
Nelson Peltz, who is seeking a seat on Disney's board of directors, he engaged Chapek about such a seat back in November of last year. In a very odd response from Chapek, who is supposed to be the CEO, the person you'd think would be the best to expedite a request like this, the CEO usually has the ear of the board. They're elected to that position by the board's members. Peltz was told, sorry, you're gonna have to take this up with the CFO, Christine McCarthy, as though she was really the one with the ability to make things happen, not Chapek. In the following week, Disney reported poor Q4 performance, and it wasn't the chief financial officer who oversaw those financials who was canned. It was instead the CEO who was canned, a move that is credited to the CFO that she was campaigning the board to oust Chapek. So whatever the truth is in all of this, the point is that we don't know all the facts because Disney refuses to speak on these important matters that set up for this current situation that we have. So what we're left with is a lot of he said, she said, lots of drama and gossip, which paves the way for an investor coup as they see this Fortune 100 company in a state of seeming disarray. So that's the background to all of this. Now we're gonna get into the present situation. So now that Bob Iger is back in as the CEO, he's in the CEO spot, he has been given a two-year mandate by the board to find a successor, a new CEO to take Disney into the future. To that end, Wednesday, Disney issued a press release announcing that Chapek era board chairman, Susan Arnold, is stepping down and taking her place is shoemaker Nike's executive chairman, Mark Parker. Mark Parker, who himself has long been rumored to be one of the possible succession candidates, someone to follow Iger in the CEO spot at Disney. He hasn't only been anointed chairman of Disney's board, Disney states, quote, Mr. Parker will also chair a newly created succession planning committee of the board, which will advise the board on CEO succession planning, including review of internal and external candidates, end quote. It is my belief that Mr. Parker himself could be someone establishment Disney is eyeing to replace Iger. And this chairman experience will result in him eventually becoming executive chairman and perhaps maybe even chief executive in the future. But Disney here looks to be saying that Parker's job actually will be finding someone else to become the new CEO. As we covered earlier this week, we have another potential candidate for the CEO spot, Parks Chairman Josh Tomorrow, who is in the New York Times taking credits for the changes being made at the park, a move many of our viewers commented could be DeMauro differentiating his own decisions from those of his bosses or subordinates, where he is starting to build out his own resume of decisions he himself takes responsibility for, perhaps vying for that top spot at the Walt Disney Company in the future here. The second matter in Disney's Wednesday press release concerns the proxy war over the makeup of Disney's board. What is a proxy war, you might ask? So at the annual shareholder meeting, which takes place typically the second week of March at the Walt Disney Company, the date for this year's shareholder meeting has yet to be announced, shareholders vote on a number of items to amend corporate bylaws and to elect board members. Disney states that they are nominating for re-election the board's current directors, but disgruntled investors who have exhausted efforts to appeal to the current board directly, as is the case with the man we're going to be talking about today, they may solicit shareholders directly to have have the shareholders, the investors in the company, elect them to the board at the next shareholders meeting, which is happening in just a couple of months. So you might be wondering, how do you get investors to vote for you? How does all of this work? Well, there are a number of methods to solicit shareholders. You can contact them directly and state your case. In many cases, you can also state your case directly in Disney's proxy statement leading up to the annual meeting, where underneath your case, Disney's board will provide their counter argument as to why they don't want you around, uh, they don't wanna do what you wanna do. Disney hasn't released this year's proxy statement yet, and this is likely why the Wednesday press release was issued, because they don't have the proxy statement ready yet, but all this is already starting to unfold. Because Tryon Partners, represented by Nelson Peltz, the man who is seeking a seat on the board, he planned to launch his campaign Thursday morning. One of the best ways to solicit shareholders and state your case is campaigning publicly. Launch a website, make your case very loudly, go on television and talk about it, and this is exactly what Nelson Peltz did yesterday. And the day before he intended to launch his campaign, Disney released this statement saying, quote, the Walt Disney Company remains open to constructive engagement and ideas that help drive shareholder value. While senior leadership of the Walt Disney Company and its board of directors 
members have engaged with Mr. Peltz numerous times over the last few months. The board does not endorse the Triang Group nominee and recommends that shareholders not support its nominee and instead vote for all the company's nominees. End quote. You'll notice Disney doesn't seem to have much of a case as to why Mr. Peltz shouldn't be nominated for the board. He certainly has a lot of experience on boards. In fact, perhaps the most of anybody. He's been on many, many boards and has a good track record on this front. Also something that should be noted here, Peltz disputes Disney's claim that they have engaged him sufficiently numerous times over the last few months. In fact, according to Yahoo Finance, quote, Iger, while speaking on a December 20th call, put off a virtual meeting between himself, the Disney board, and Peltz until sometime in January because he planned to sail his yacht off the coast of New Zealand, end quote. Whatever you may think of Iger, look, the guy is allowed to take vacations, but it is interesting that we have this mental picture of, you know, Iger is very busy trying to put the company back together, that he's conducting all these meetings, trying to negotiate standstill agreements with these dissenting investors who are very upset. Uh, He's trying to not cause a war here when the reality looks like it doesn't line up exactly with that mental picture. Now that we've covered everything surrounding this developing proxy war, all the background everything going on, we can finally get to the actual case for change at Disney. The campaign is called Restore the Magic, and here we get to hear what Nelson Peltz, who wants to join Disney's board, what he has to say and what he wants to do, why he wants to become someone on the board of directors at the Walt Disney Company. Heading to the website, the first point established is Disney's relative weakness to the S&P 500 on a 1, 3, 5, and 10 year basis, which is pretty shocking to see. I'll inject some analysis in right here, right now. It's not really a fair comparison to compare Disney to the S&P 500, because if you compare Disney to their actual competition, similar companies in their industry, which has particular expenses and different issues that they face, especially when it comes to streaming. For example, if you compare Disney to a very similar company, Comcast, you'll notice that there isn't much of a difference in performance at all. I'm not making excuses for Disney here or their financial performance, but I just wanted to point that out. Tryon also points out Disney's financial performance has been disappointing post the 21st Century Fox deal. This is something that is a very valid point. Fox increased Disney's leverage. I think they paid way too much for Fox. I told you guys back when we still had Chapek as CEO, I felt like there was some money that Chapek wanted to put towards the parks because Chapek does kind of understand the parks, you know, in like a base way where he knows if you put more money in, you're going to get more money out. But the necessity to feed both the Disney Plus monster and feed their massive pile of Fox debt precluded any sort of real capital expense expenditure at the parks, any sort of new capital expenditure beyond just completing current projects. And even on that front, Disney was very, very slow to do all of that. This is an issue at Disney, which has not been resolved. I believe this is still the case to this day, uh, why we're not seeing a lot of investment at the parks. Scrolling down, Tryon believes that Disney's corporate governance is poor. There's no heir apparent right now at Disney. There hasn't been for a long time. Uh, There's no one to replace Iger, really, and Chapek, that didn't really work out. So this is a provably true point. They definitely do have poor corporate governance. I I don't know how you can make a different case. That's just the fact. There's no succession plan. You fail the corporate governance. It's really that simple. They also assert that strategy and operations are poor. This one, I agree, the strategy is all over the place. But the assertion from Tryon that, uh, you know, streaming could be done a whole lot better. I don't really know of anybody who does streaming well. You know, Netflix, they're the kingpin in this arena. And even there, the performance is nothing to write home about because streaming is just such a giant money vacuum, which heading into this high interest rate environment where borrowing money becomes harder and harder and harder. This whole business model starts to fall apart because it so much depends on an endless flow of virtually free money, uh, free debt, where you're constantly able to fund these extremely expensive shows to try to get people on the service. And there's sort of this idea that one day in the future, all the customers are just going to stay on the service and the streaming services won't have to make as much new content. But thus far, this has not turned out to be the case. Also, Tryon believes that capital allocation is poor. Capital allocation, you know, that sounds kind of boring. What does that even mean? But every single one of us fans has been saying this just in a different way. A good example of bad capital allocation, look at Journey into Imagination with Figment and Epcot, which is falling apart. It has a lot of malfunctions and it's super old. It needs an update. That is a great example of poor capital allocation at Disney, where in their premier theme parks, they have things that are falling apart because the allocation of capital, where Disney's priorities are, 
where they put money, it is not very good. So very good point on that front. This table here is very interesting. So Peltz's firm states that his intention in becoming a board member is not to replace Iger or break up Disney or have Disney accrue more debt or cut costs in a way that makes the guest experience worse or increase prices. What they want to do is enforce that mandate that Iger has two years to turn the ship around, that he finds a replacement and heads out the door. He wants Disney to deleverage in an orderly manner. That point is huge because I believe once the Fox nightmare is behind us and Disney's debt is under control, that will enable large spending at the parks once again, like we saw with all the new lands and attractions we got between 2013 and 2020. We are still benefiting from the tail end of the last round of capital investment back when Disney didn't have as much leverage with Tron, which is opening this April. After that, there's really not a whole lot to look forward to, and I think it has a lot to do with this, the debt from Fox, the debt from Disney+, Plus, and Disney's also spending towards another big expenditure where they are going to have to buy a portion of Hulu, so that'll be more debt that Disney will need to figure out what they're doing with. I believe the debt is the primary reason why the park's investment has gone into the floor as of late, and so much talent has left, and also something that's been affected by Disney's obligations on the leverage side of things is the dividend for shareholders, and here Pelt says that he wants to bring the dividend back by fiscal year 2025, uh, which is pretty ambitious. That is a big, big deal. So these are the main points that are on the Restore the Magic homepage. Now we're going to take a look at the presentation. We're going to take a look at the slide deck here, which I'm also going to link in the description below if you just want to peruse it at will, read everything. There's some great stuff in there. After establishing Peltz's credibility in the first section of slides and his track record and all of that, first we have a slide comparing Disney's total shareholder return versus the broader market. And you can see Disney has performed quite poorly in this regard. This next slide I showed briefly in our video yesterday, where you can see fiscal 2018 versus fiscal 2022, and how under JPEG we saw such a focus on revenue, 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 increased guest revenue, Genie Plus this, $700 hotel room that, and despite all of this, the shareholders actually got shafted in every other metric they care about on the balance sheet. JPEG bragged about how they had increased guest spending at the domestic parks by 40% since 2019, yet somehow in that same period, earnings per share went down for the shareholders. Why is that? We know why. It's the aftershocks of Iger's Fox deal. Also a huge part of it, of course, is Disney Plus, which isn't making a profit. Next, Peltz lists off Disney's board of directors, how long each member has been on the board, and how Disney stock has performed under each of their tenures. Iger and Arnold have been around long enough uh, where under them we've seen significant returns for shareholders. The more recent members, though, while they've resided on the board, the shareholder returns have declined by almost half, which is wild stuff. This is one of the key slides where people more knowledgeable in finance than myself are articulating points that I've tried to make, attempted to make in the past, insofar as the Fox acquisition, the Fox deal, how that was bad for Disney. They're really showing it here in a very statistics-driven way, a visual way too. This is very, very impressive. So we're going to take some time analyzing this. So on the left graph, you have Disney's earnings minus the park segment for fiscal year 2018, amounting to $9.4 billion. This is one when Disney acquired Fox. This is the year that they did so. That year, the Fox components that Disney acquired earned $1.9 billion. Disney's valuation for acquiring Fox, though, is not just based on Fox's earnings. It was based on a valuation many, many, many multiples more, in large part due to the idea of synergy. That being that once Fox's content was under Disney's roof, it would enable Fox's content to earn much more than it was as a separate entity. So the synergies aspect is valued at $2 billion dollars here. So you'd assume you'd add up all these components together and in fiscal 2022, Disney's earnings minus parks would be around $13 billion. And then on the very right, you can see in reality what we saw this year. Disney minus parks made $7.1 billion in earnings, subtract the streaming losses they incurred, and you're left with $3.1 billion uh, if you take the parks component out of it. This is to me why I often preface my compliments to Iger with, you know, I'm not his biggest fan or something like that. Look at these financials. This is just absolutely atrocious. And this is Chapex's fault as well with the 
streaming losses, but Iger is the one who bought Fox and look how poorly that has panned out here. They paid way too much for Fox in my opinion. Iger buying Fox has increased Disney's leverage to the point where we don't get large investments in the parks. The dividend isn't getting paid. They're jacking up prices in the parks to subsidize these other areas. Looking at this data where you take the stellar parks earnings out of Disney's financial soup, you start to realize that us park fans, we are really subsidizing a company focused on studios, which are vastly underperforming and being led by folks who are there to enrich themselves and line the pockets of their friends. Tryon goes on to point out Iger's pay doesn't line up with his performance, how succession at Disney is totally broken. They also point out how direct to consumer is a nightmare of a business model and it's projected to lose money into the future. So its losses are just compounding and compounding and compounding into the tens of billions of dollars. They also point out how Disney's costs are increasing far more than their sales are. And then we have the final slide, which Parks fans, safe to say, were quite happy to see and talking a lot about on social media yesterday. This investor attempting to get on the board says, quote, we fear Disney is over earning in domestic parks to subsidize streaming losses. They point out how our love of the parks and the money that we put towards the parks is being used to prop up this company that has a lot of dysfunctional stuff happening with it. How Disney is right now risking strikes and the quality of their relationship with longtime cast members over, and I'm not making this up, a $1 raise. To end off this scathing report, Tryon says, quote, Disney may believe that price increases in nickel and diming of cast members and other costs is good for the bottom line. However, we suspect it is short-term thinking that puts the brand value and long-term health of the business at risk." End quote, uh, which is to say that us fans are not too happy with this stuff and uh, we're not gonna hang around forever if things continue trending the direction they are. Can we get a standing ovation for this report? Such awesome stuff, man. We're not done yet though. There's a lot more to discuss here because now we're gonna look under the surface level statements. You have the surface level stuff going on. There's more under the hood uh, from both sides in this Disney War 2.0. We're really gonna try to get an idea of what's actually happening here. So in response to this slide deck, I was on Twitter saying, man, this is everything we've been been saying for so long, I hope some contingent of institutional investors like banks, like large investors like Nelson Peltz here, they get in there, they make changes, they clean house. The current executives, they are embarrassing. They're gossiping about each other in the newspaper. And in this slide deck, it is detailed in excruciating detail how badly the current people are at running a media company. Often the criticism of these uh, investors that want to come in, people say, oh, you don't have media experience. Well, you know, do the people who are in this media company really seem to have that great of media experience based on this performance. It really doesn't seem like they're doing that great of a job. There's so much mismanagement happening, especially at the board level, as we've seen with their management of Chapek, keeping him on as long as they did, uh, giving him the CEO spot in the first place. And then of course with Iger, who has made some bad decisions, they approved these acquisitions, casting Disney into a pool of debt. So clearly change is needed here. To my excitement though, I was cautioned by insiders. Some of our sources, they said, be careful what you wish for, Brayden, because while it may seem like a welcome change to have someone like Nelson Peltz come in here and represent our interests, Peltz specifically said yesterday, by the way, that they need to increase capital expenditure at the parks, which was so great to hear. You know, here's the thing. These insiders were telling me, you know, a lot of these activist investors, what they're really after is money, of course. They just want to line their own pockets. They might just split the company up, sell parts of it. So this isn't all one-sided. There is a case to be made for maintaining the status quo, what we have the whole rather the devil you know than the devil you don't kind of argument. But here's the thing. As we all see in this report, and I think this is something we all know instinctively, the parks are awesome and they work and they make huge money independent of everything else Disney's doing. The parks, the Disney parks, they don't need ABC or ESPN or sports betting or 21st Century Fox in order to be successful. Peltz, who is vying for a voice in the decision-making process here, he is making our points. He is stating our beliefs. Meanwhile, the board has done nothing for us. They appoint folks who have made the experience worse for us, so it really seems like why not shake things up? Right now, if I was voting, I would lean in favor of voting for Peltz to get a seat on the board here. It's not like he's taking over the entire company. We're talking about a seat at the table for someone who is saying the things that we're saying, which definitely sounds like a positive development. But here's where we get to what I've been alluding to about maybe there's something more going on with all of this. There was a little throwaway line that I heard when the news first broke from CNBC's David Faber, which set off alarm bells because one notable conflict in this Restore the Magic campaign 
is on the homepage, they say, hey, we aren't against Iger. And then if you actually go into their presentation, into their report, it basically is all about detailing how Iger has done a terrible job. So clearly this campaign has a bone to pick with Iger. Well, hardcore fans who know all the players in the Disney sphere that we've seen influence things over the last decade, they're going to know what this means right away. It turns out that Nelson Peltz is allegedly quite close to Isaac Perlmutter. And if you don't know who Ike Perlmutter is, he is often blamed for why Parks Chairman Tom Staggs was blocked from becoming CEO and why he left the company, which is part of why we don't have a succession plan at Disney, why there wasn't someone to replace Iger, which now Ike's buddy is completely complaining about and using as a reason to get on the board, which is not particularly honest or transparent on his part because someone that he's friends with may have had a hand in why the succession is so messed up. We have heard from sources time and time again in the newspapers for many years that Isaac Perlmutter has a bone to pick with Iger, that they have had an adversarial relationship. It is said that Chapek was vouched for by Perlmutter to get the park's chairman job in the first place, and then he might have even been instrumental in his rise to become CEO. And we know how Chapek went with all the nickel and diming. So this little mention of the connective tissue between Peltz and Perlmutter, which may have a lot to do with our current situation that we have at Disney, it makes me wonder when we talk about a Disney War 2.0, is it really just, you know, these random, you know, activist investors just showing up, uh, you know, and just being mad at the company? Or is there a phantom menace in the mix here who for a long time has had very valid concerns about how Iger spends the company's money? how he manages it, but most definitely there is a personal dynamic going on here where Peltz's Palm Beach pal had his authority over the Marvel Cinematic Universe stripped away from him back in the mid-2010s, way back when, by none other than CEO Bob Iger. And since then, Mr. Perlmutter has allegedly blocked the rise of people we thought would be very good as CEO, like Tom Staggs. And I think the reason why Perlmutter feels this way is because he feels that we need a new kind of CEO that is a very different business philosophy than just endlessly acquiring company and accruing debt as we've seen under Iger. Needless to say, I'm definitely giving you guys a lot to chew on here. And one last thing to mention, when we talk about votes at the annual shareholders meeting coming up, there are funds that have huge sway in the voting here. In the 2022 proxy statement from Disney, we see that Disney's largest shareholder, Vanguard, they don't actually own any sole voting stock. They have about 3 million shares of shared voting stock, but the second largest holder of the Walt Disney Company, BlackRock, as of January of last year, they had sold voting power with respect to 99,711,026 shares. So that's a big voting block right there. Now, these large institutions, they've been invested for a very long time, so I assume that these powers are what enforce the current established order that we have at Disney, the current executives we have, the current board that we have. You start to wonder if these disgruntled investors with very valid concerns, if they can convince these large institutions that they can do a better job and make better returns for the parties that the like of Vanguard and BlackRock represent, you know, that could be a paradigm shift. If they could convince BlackRock or Vanguard, you know, to flip, to actually vote for Pelts, to add him to the board, uh, to give more of a balance to the board, a new perspective, that would be a big, big deal. Is that likely though? Probably not. Can Pelts still get the seat and try to turn things around for Disney without the support of the lead institutional investors? Maybe, but that would hinge on the retail investors hearing Pelts' concerns, agreeing with him, and answering the call by being active voters in this upcoming annual shareholders meeting. Also something that should be noted for those of you who have heard all of this and want to be participants in this proxy fight, please do note that on last year's proxy statement, the date you had to be a shareholder by in order to vote was January 10th, 2022. So if you're not a shareholder right now and you do want to vote and you're like trying to buy up shares right now, do know that you might be buying after uh, the window and you might not be able to vote. We don't know that for sure. Um, I'm just basing it off of what we saw last year. I don't know which date is going to be the one where Disney tallies up all the shares and all the shareholders here. I presume that Disney is putting together their 2023 proxy statement as we speak. I am not a current shareholder of the Walt Disney Company, so I myself will not be voting. But if you are one in a month or two, you will have a way to vote on what happens at the Walt Disney Company, what the future of the parks is. That isn't the way that we often recommend, which is just vote with your wallet. Shareholders soon will actually be able to vote for someone with a different perspective to join Disney's board. As I said, 
said at the beginning though, while I like what we're seeing from Peltz and his firm here, they're making some great arguments here. The whole idea of activist investors inserting themselves into the company, I think it all gives us pause uh, based off of some bad experiences that Disney's had in the past that ended up being very costly. And folks who are in the Disney sphere, in that bubble, um, they've told me in uh, you know recent hours, hey, you know, be careful what you wish for because these activist investors, they might just be here to line their own pockets. But my counter to that is, isn't that the case with the current executives too? Aren't they there lining their pockets as well? When I said on Twitter that I'd like to see a bank or investor come in and clean house in the C-suites by bringing in new people, some Disney fans said, Brayden, you really want hedge funds in charge of Disney? You know, a creative organization? What's happened to you? To which I replied, that's exactly what we already have. You know, we've been under this Disney that has been run by institutions since the early 80s. Since the early 80s, Disney has been run by institutional investors, by NBA executives. They have been calling the shots at Disney. It ceased being a family company in the early 1980s. And even back when Disney still was a family company, there were a lot of outside financial interests that were giving Disney, the Disney family, the money to do what they wanted to do to bring their dreams to life. And it was creating a lot of issues. We're going all the way back to the 1950s, Walt had to make his own separate company, WED, to develop plans for Disneyland for the very reason of institutional investors getting in the way of what he wanted to do. And that issue has become more and more pervasive over time and still exists to this day. It's the worst it's ever been. So if the argument against Peltz is that he's there to make money or that financial institutions will rule over Disney, we already have that right now. It'll just be a different board member with a different philosophy, one who is presenting himself as very pro-consumer, especially parks consumer consumer like ourselves, as well as speaking up for the cast members. You know, if I want to be cynical about it, maybe he's appealing to us because he knows retail investors are his best bet. And then once he gets in there, it'll be business as usual. But his relationship with Perlmutter, uh, his alleged relationship with Perlmutter, that makes me think that his stated goals are genuine to upset the apple cart and make Disney into a company that runs properly for the long term, which is something that Isaac Perlmutter has been after for a long, long time, tried to do at Disney. Lots of things to consider here. I'm very suspect how far this proxy war will really go. It could fizzle out. Some sort of agreement could be met before the annual shareholders meeting. There still is a significant amount of time between now and the meeting in March, but it also might not fizzle out. And that's why I wanted to give you guys as much info as I could here on what is currently happening. So you guys uh, can come up with your own conclusions as to what's going on here. Again, I am not endorsing Team Pelts or Team Iger at this time. I think there are some un stated motives and personal conflicts going on, which affect both sides here. There's a lot more under the hood than just the stated positions and what you see in the news, but I'm quite receptive to Peltz's arguments and very interested to see what happens next with the Restore the Magic campaign. Also a disclaimer, nothing said in this video constitutes financial advice. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe with those notifications on so you don't miss videos like these in the future, where I will let you know the second we hear more as far as the developments on this front, everything going on with this Disney war that is unfolding as we speak. It is a wild time to be covering the Disney news. It's been a crazy week of news. Make sure you've watched all the videos this week. We talked about a lot. We got a lot of news this week. Thank you so much for watching. From the Mickey Muse Magic Studio, this is Brayden. Have a magical day.